Good morning and welcome to this week's webinar. Um, last week we talked about our clients going to save you if recession hits and this week we're going to sort of change the focus a little bit. We're going to change the focus to what does recession proofing your business entail and will you grow, stand still or shrink in recession? To help us this week, we're joined by Stuart Hutchinson, who's a senior partner at UHY, uh, the recruitment accountant. Um, and talk a little bit more about Stuart before the end. As normally, what I like to get stuck into is a couple of facts to see what's going on. And it's interesting the comments that business leaders are saying. So this has come out of Inc. So while you need to prepare for potential turndown, what they're saying is keep a sense of perspective. If the economy does contract in the next 12 months, it could be the most viral recession business owners have experienced since 2008. But think, in 2008, Motorola were the dominant cell phone company. MySpace boasted more users than any other social media site, and Twitter was less than a year old. Facebook had yet to introduce the like button. So you think about the economy, it is only endured at the moment a single quarter of negative GTP growth, and yet hashtag recession, hashtag recession proof your business has already gained more than 250 million views on TikTok. So according to PwC, in June 2020, uh, 2022, sorry, the economy shrunk by 0.06%, which sort of polarised growth recording at regional levels. And at regional levels, they're, what they're saying is, while the economic output stood at 0.9% above the pre-pandemic levels of 2020, some regions are struggling to break through and break beyond pre-pandemic pre levels, if I could say it, deepening the regional growth imbalance. The latest data shows that London is growing at the fastest rate in Q3 2022, uh, 21, sorry, while other regions such as the Northeast, Midlands and Wales actually experienced a contraction of between 1.2% and 0.3%. So what we're saying is that we're still around 3.3% smaller than pre-pandemic levels, but America we know are already above pre-pandemic levels from there. The Growth outlook for the UK has deteriorated, obviously, with GDP expected to grow between 3.1 and 3.6, followed by two years of slow or even negative GDP growth is what they're producing now. Regardless of the political stance, though, we've got to sort of all agree that economic growth is desirable. The challenge is how to pursue it against a backdrop of ongoing geological, uh, geopolitical uncertainty, stagflation, productivity gaps and the cost of living. So on that happy note, <laughs> I'd like to welcome Stuart to the webinar. Stuart, as I said, is the founder of the recruitment uh, accountants brand of UHY Hacker Young. They provide specialist national and international finance services around the recruitment industry. Stuart and his team advise boards uh, ranging from owner managed right up through to large businesses, right through to startups and multi million pound corporations, covering everything from back office support through to the voice in the boardroom. Today, I'm also joined by Heather and Paul from Jump. So, Stuart. I'm going to start oh. us off with a nice, easy question. <laughs> On Friday, we had a mini, or should I say a major budget. And no, as we've no. seen, the pound has fallen, you know, massively. So, Stuart, in concise as you can possibly make it, what did you make of the budget? Well, thanks for having me, first <laughs> Thanks for the first question. Um, I think putting aside all the, the media circus that's going on and the impact it's had on the financial markets, there was certainly a lot in there. Um, the intent, I believe, was good. Um, you know, the idea of cutting taxes for low earners, high earners, corporates, the house, house owners is all, is all very honourable and admirable, um, as is the plan to stimulate growth and investment in the UK. But there's a but, and I think the but is it's very unbalanced um, and it shows a, a little bit of potential naivety. Um, for me, I think they've all gone a little bit too hard, too quick. Um, you know, the economic environment, as you've just you've just spelled out, is still fragile. And we're not we're not yet through that. And I don't think 
the world can cope with such a dramatic proposal. So we'll find out whether their plan comes to fruition in the long term, in the short term. It's tough and we may see a few U-turns over the next few days. Liz, tr Liz Trust doing a U-turn, that that's, that seems to be unbelievable. <laughs> that's I've it never happened before, <laughs> has it? I just want to stagger it. Ooh, political, Mr. <laughs> Jacob. Political. Well, let's, let's, let's not get into the political ins and outs, because I think that's far, far below us, uh, beneath us. We, 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 we need to stand above above that and talk sense, well, I think. Can I can I just inject a small amount of optimism into your slightly um, less optimistic opening, which I think is utterly justified. Your the lack of optimism in that. I am the accountant. But, um, <laughs> Correct. <laughs> last week I was uh, fortunate enough to be um, at an REC strategy event, and we had the chair, uh, the president of the World Employment Confederation there, and we also had the deputy chief economist from the CBI fascinating women um with you know huge amounts of knowledge and experience and access to data and what they said was really interesting is that the you know the recruitment industry has always been a bit of a bellwether of the economy yeah. so you know we there's this really direct link between the growth of the economy the strength of the economy and the, the recruitment industry and how we do but what they said is that they are seeing worldwide an uncoupling of that relationship in a way that we've not seen before um, and that's to do with the really desperate talent shortage that we all know, right? So we know in our businesses what an issue the candidate short market is and continues to be. And what they're saying is that that is causing an uncoupling. So despite the fact that there are, you know, some pretty serious headwinds and some pretty serious things going on in the economy, it doesn't necessarily mean this time that it will, there will be a direct relationship between recruitment, talent, sourcing and yeah. the way the economy is going so I, i'm not saying there's not going to be an impact but it was very interesting to hear these two women talk yeah. about the change in trends um and the fact that there are lots of organizations who are, are talking about not making redundancies because it's take it's been so hard to find people mm. that they don't want to you know it's not like in the past where you could just get rid of people and then you'd replace them later on mm. They, you know, they genuinely know how tough it is to find people. So they're holding on to them and they're still trying to find people, despite the fact that their business isn't going to grow because they've got a lot of it. You know, we know how many vacancies there are. So I do think it's and it'll be interesting to watch the impact of that uncoupling on our industry over the coming time. I do think we should think very carefully about that with our planning. It was interesting last week we talked about this last week about inflation and uh, employment figures. And yeah. there's only been one recession in the last seven recessions where employment figures have been high and inflation has been high. And so it's really interesting to sort of look at how they correlate yeah. that together. Yeah. But let's sort of move this on because I know we've got sort of a lot to discuss today. I know Stuart's got lots to, to, to input. So when we look at changes in economic cycles, because what we're talking about is economic cycles. Stuart, are there any specific areas of a, you know the, the company's business plan that should absolutely come priority when business cycles start to change um yes i think the first thing to do is to encourage everybody to have a plan um, <laughs> i think lots of people believe a plan is a few numbers on a spreadsheet um so i'd encourage people to um think beyond that but for me the, the way to approach it is to scenario plan and contingency plan particularly when you've got this kind of cloud hanging over us um, you know, we've just come through a pretty rough time. Um, a lot of a lot of the people on this call and, and who will listen to this webinar should have pretty good experience of what's happened in the last two years. And that was that was different, but it was an economic shock nonetheless. And hopefully they've, they've learned some lessons about you know, how they've prepared their businesses and the mistakes or, the, or the, the things they did well during that period that they may need to repeat. Um, you know, there's some there's some obvious points that we should consider. You know, cash is king in good times and bad times. Yeah. Um, people are key. You know, they're the they're your biggest asset. Look after them, and they'll look after you. Um, I don't know does that does that answer the. So it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting that exactly the same. We had two clients on last week, and they said exactly the same. Not so yeah. much cash is king, but they said you know people are king to your business and it's very different to going through lockdown where we you know 
jettisoned a lot of people really quickly and it's probably too early where you know hanging on to these people now is really important Paul you were going to say something yeah, I, was just, I was just going to pick up on a couple of points both uh, Stuart and Heather had made and I, I think that this time round um, and just picking on the point that you know having come out of Covid which was an extraordinary period in history it wasn't just an extraordinary period in our lives it was just a historical moment in history but it has taken companies a long time to try to recover from what was essentially not just a handbrake but a complete dead hole in many instances for the best part of 18 months for many for many businesses and this skills gap you know the one that heather referred to it hasn't gone away you know we've got 1.3 million vacancies in this country and the lowest level of unemployment since records began pretty much um there are there's just and you've got brexit that uh, i have to say is one of the underpinning issues behind the lack of staff availability and i think the fact is that and the, uh, just picking up stuart's point you know the, the truth is that people are the most valuable asset that you have our companies know that our clients know that they're still struggling to find people and then importantly retain people and i think for recruitment companies the same issue prevails it's taken quite a while for us to get back to fighting fitness again we've recruited great people in our businesses we need to look after those people and I think that this situation now moving into this economic cycle is different from the recessions that I've experienced in my 40 odd years in the industry. Um, as yet, I'm not hearing, and I don't think Heather is or how it is, any enormous levels of stories around uh, our clients' clients telling them they're putting on recruitment freezes or holding back from recruiting. We're not seeing that, we're not hearing that. In fact, all I hear consistently from our clients is they're drowning in jobs. I do think that coming around the corner, there will be some impact. I think it's already going to happen. I think there'll be candidate shortages becoming even more obvious, but we'll come back to that. I don't see that despite what's been going on in the last week with the plunging pound and Heather and I comparing our pension woes yesterday <laughs> evening. Oh, even, woe is oh, me. <laughs> please don't talk about it. Why did I mention it? I, I mean, I think that we, we're not going to see a catastrophic impact on the recruitment industry. That's my view. But we'll come back to that. And just on Stuart's point, I do think people need to, and I'm certainly speaking with clients all the time at the moment, about making plans, looking at contingencies and getting ahead of the situation so that we're not caught out in the way that obviously everybody was caught out during COVID. And I think what we're going to talk about, because you know, next week we're away at the Expo, and then the week after that we're going to do a conversation on planning, and that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, a plan is not a budget. A plan is a plan. It's a completely different thing to the figured budget. But I think the biggest thing that we've, we've got to get around, and I'd, I'd be very interested to see hear your comments on this, Stuart, is you know, we talked a lot about the mindset of leaders during recession. So from an accounting point of view, what mindset should l leaders actually have when we talk about the recession because obviously you're the people that talk to them about the money and that's the bit that really sort of is at the heart of most people what mindset do you think a, a leader should have i think paul's just touched on this by by what he's just said um i think the, the best advice i can give is that people need to come to terms with this quickly and they need to not be in denial or shock or get frustrated by it because if they do they're at risk of being dragged along by the market and they lose control of their own future so it's very much get into a position where you're accepting of what's happened happened or likely to happen. And when you link it all together with all the, the planning that's going on, financially, that gives you, I guess, an oversight of what your business may or may not look like. And you can come to terms with that and you can adjust your mindset accordingly. Um, you know, just just sitting here thinking it's it's going to be okay is probably yeah. not the way forward yeah denial is not an answer i mean you no. know I, I think one of the things that everyone says to me is that and this is interesting that they've been through covid they survived covid you know we got through it as a business as businesses um and it was about as horrible outside of a, a war as i'd imagine anything could be in terms of how you run your business and I think people have gathered strength from that experience. I think that there's a view that, you know, if we get through that, I can pretty much deal with anything. Um, I think people have learned a huge amount from that experience, um, how to deal with a real catastrophe. And I, and I believe they're looking at the next sort of year or two and thinking, all right, it's going to be challenging. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, I've been through worse. 
and and I and I've learned some very valuable lessons during that period, and I'm feeling strong, mentally strong about how I'm going to cope with what's coming in my direction in the next eighteen months. Um, I'm not sure that people would have viewed the ensuing economic cycle with quite that level of um, uh, well, kind of that robust thinking had they not been through COVID in the first instance. Yeah, I agree. I think have, have you got anything to, to push onto that? I completely agree. Um, so and you know, I heard at the weekend, Howard, that people come onto this seminar. One of the reasons they come onto our webinars is to hear me giving Paul Jacobs a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> that's not just you. That's everybody that comes onto this webinar gives Paul Jacobs a hard time. I've, I've had to cut his email account so that people can stop emailing him such you know, slander. Um, I think I looked at you know, that that comment, you know keep your friends closer, keep your enemies even closer. And I think your friends are all about your, your, your management team and developing your management team. Your enemy is keeping your eye on your figures and making sure that it doesn't run away with itself and it doesn't become a mind bend constantly. And I've always looked at it in that way, even sort of going through the recessions that I've been through with the, the, the teams that I've got. It's about how positive your management team push the, the, the business and drive the business forward and I've had my best years always in those recession periods by keeping a really close eye on my management team and what they're doing but obviously I've been having a very realistic understanding of the figures that sit, sit behind that and how you're driving people forward and I think if your managers get you know their head into recession and they start to think about recession and they build all the pillars that come with recession and that's when that negative overtone sort of comes into the business and i think if we start to think about how we are you know manage the most influential people in the business even your team leaders sat at desk are more influential than md sat in his ivory tower when they, they look at staff so um, i think yeah, the mindset of your management team is absolutely important. So as a leader, you have to be the one that stands up and, you know, talk about the positivity of how we can drive out this this this, this period of time and talk reality about the facts and figures that there rather than scaremongering. And it's interesting the stats that you all bring out, you know, that, that, you know, that, that, that there's some very positive stats there. It's only a very small shrinkage. It's not a huge shrinkage. You go to 2008, the shrinkage was absolutely you know, catastrophic. You know, we've got a very small shrinkage and we've got the highest you know, unemployment ever. Oh. So, you know, there is, to, as Paul was yeah. saying, lots and lots of sort of uh, light at the end of the tunnel that we should be aiming for. So, yeah, I mean, Howard, just a quick point. I mean, uh, again, you know, uh, we were talking last night, Heather and I, because we are of a certain age, should we say, <laughs> Um, that we recall when we back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, you know, our mortgage rate and my first my first flat when I was a youngster was at a rate of 15.5% or something in that order. That was yeah, yeah mine was 15.9. There you go. And, yeah. you know, so I know uh, this is where we do sound very old, but, you know, <laughs> people they don't know how lucky they are. It's, <laughs> you know, we've been through worse. Think for it's yourself. True. Yes, yeah, the, the younger generation, they just don't know they're alive. It's, but it's true, you know, we have been through worse. We've been through those situations. Uh, obviously, the current generation are used to very, very, very low interest rates. This is all a bit of a shock. But we're it a mile is. away from where it's been in the past. Thank you. Absolutely. God. And, and we discussed that last week, Artreich. So, yeah, we, we know what, what's going on from there. <laughs> oh, so. <God. laughs> so the question when we talk about then is, you know, Everyone talks about plan for the worst and hope for the best. You know, you know, to me, that's not a, you know, hope is not a strategy. But if you look to grow your business irrespective of the recession, if you look at that, Stuart, what would you focus on when we start to look to grow your business? So when I when I talk to a client, whether it's a client of mine or a potential new client, I'm I'm probably interested in two things: what's their commercial vision and what's their cultural vision. Fundamentally. Um, because that gives me an insight into what they're trying to achieve and whether or not I can help them be successful. If we're focusing on the numbers in particular, um, you focus on what's your biggest cost and what's your, your biggest output. And clearly the, the, the ratio that is most important at that point is your staff cost to your net fee income ratio. And you can walk into a business at any point and say, actually guys, you've got it right or other business actually you've got it quite wrong and and those are those are some of the metrics that you can analyze that just at a headline level um to help you point a business in a direction where it needs to address some key issues if it is to succeed irrespective of 
boom or bust situations. Um, you know, again, I can refer back to cash being fundamental, fundamental to to investing in your business in a downturn or an upturn. Yeah. Paul, anything you want to add to that? Look, I think, you know, Stuart says it very well. One of the things that I've been speaking to clients about uh, is to look, you know, very much looking at costs, obviously. But it's also about keeping an eye on things like credit control, uh, because, you know, some businesses are going to struggle as we get through this winter period. You know, credit, uh, credit checking, all those kind of things are very important. One of the things I'd add, and I think we haven't said it yet, but I'm going to just say it's an extremely important mindset is that we need to be close to our clients. You know, how correctly you said, we need to be close to them, our managers and what they're thinking and keeping their morale in the right direction. But you know, you, we are really in a dangerous place if we fail to regularly meet with our clients and understand what they're thinking about, how they're feeling about the future, their mindsets. So I think it's not just internally um, focused, it's very much externally focused and certainly you know, cash is king. Absolutely, all those things are correct. But you know, to understand what's truly likely to happen over the next twelve or eighteen months, you have to be super tight to your clients in this period. So I think that yeah, goes. The other thing. Sorry. No, go, on, go on, Heather. Go on. No, go, so, Heather. The other thing I'd add to that is, um, you you may well have hired people who've only been with you in the last couple of years, yeah, and who are used to a market with a glut of jobs. Um, and, a, and a candidate shortage and and in some, in some markets it being pretty easy to smash your budgets and and to make placements now they're going to be moving into working in a, a more difficult market so however you know whatever the grade of of disaster we think we're heading into it's going to be a bit more challenging at least right so just think about what the different skill sets that your teams are going to need yes. in a, in the changing market um, and start really thinking about how you're going to address that at those training needs, those learning needs, those attitudinal needs, those perspective needs. And, you know, if we're going to do the things that Paul says about which are completely right about getting even closer to our clients and staying close to our clients and focus on that, you know, have your have your team got the skills to do that. Mm. Um, and maybe now if things are slightly less chaotically busy than they've been in some markets, now's the time actually to focus on really upskilling. So if we, we, if we if we if we go back to what we did when at the beginning of lockdown, and this is the bit where you focus on as what Stuart says, you know, plan for the plan your you know down the revenue, you know, gross profit per head per person, you know, what's it what's it developing, what's it looking at? It's where you get that gross profit from, and that's from your client base and your existing client base. And when we went back, at the, if you look back to the beginning of lockdown, we ran two webinars on a Wednesday. We ran a webinar at this time for management, as we're talking now, and then a webinar at two o'clock in the afternoon hmm. on the core basics of recruitment. And they got absolutely loads of people on there hmm training on the core base of recruitment upskilling you know and i think what you're saying there heather is absolutely the priority is that your people will get you through recession but there's going to be a change in what is required from them from a sales perspective and it's you know if you think just sending emails out and a marketing campaign you're suddenly going to get a lot of requirements through that's not really going to happen you need to start to look at the core basics of your recruitment and start to really canvas your clients and start to build your client base and that means checking on the capitalization of your current customers you know who's going to spend who's not going to spend who's what's going to do with those, with, with those with those customers because if you don't then you just you might be pitching at the wrong people so it's having that target approach and i think upskilling your people to be able to do that is absolutely paramount because you're right there's lots of new people in the marketplace you know and we can almost go from 2012 onwards that haven't ever seen a bear market and yeah, you know, they don't the, know what it's like no, they no, don't. No, That's so, true. so when planning the financial side of the business and this is a, a, another sort of strange sort of view how often should you ne let your employees know what the financial implications are of success and failure Who's going first, Joe? Yeah. Well, well no. not me. I'm fluffy HR. I don't do nothing. <laughs> you do the horrible stuff, HR. I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer, Howard. I think it comes down to a company's values and inclusivity. Um, it also comes down to the mindset of the leader of the business. My view is I prefer to be open. I think you don't want people having 
um, or feeling fear mm. at, at any point, whether and and that's that's striking the balance. So it's whether or not they're fearing because they don't know, or they're yeah. fearing because you've told them too much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, can I sit on the fence on that one? No, well, well, <laughs> well, no, you, don't, just... you don't get to do that. I mean, look, I think you make a great point, Stuart. I think keeping people in the dark is not the answer. You know, uh, I think you don't want to spook people. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the last thing we want to do is to uh, upset people. People feel that, and you know, most people need to feel secure. Absolutely, we said earlier that. You know, we don't think it's going to be as you know as tough or as catastrophic in our industry sector as it as it has been in the past uh, during a recessive climate. Um, but I'll add to that. I think that if you've got great leaders and you have a real vision for the future, um, I've witnessed and worked in businesses that have grown dramatically and very successfully during recessionary climates. Just because there's a recession doesn't mean that you can't continue as a business to develop and grow. And that the people in your business can't develop and grow. Um, I think it is mindset, but it's also a lot to do with the vision and the passion of the people that run the company. So the, the, the sitting on the fence thing is, I understand that entirely. I think it's about making sure people understand the realities. But I also think it's very important to keep people very upbeat, very motivated, be very clear about your vision, where you're going, how you're going to get there, what's in it for the people that work with you, and when you get there, and how they're going to develop and how they'll they'll grow as professionals, both in terms of their careers and indeed financially. Um, but it's very much about having that robust attitude. Um, I don't think it's about necessarily sharing every element of your profit and loss or your balance sheet and so forth. I don't think that's necessary. Uh, but I do think it's about, broadly speaking, letting people know what's going on. And I think if you fail to do that and you keep people in the dark, then you create panic. And uh, if that happens, and you said it very well earlier, Stuart, look after the people look after you. I mean, if you fail to do that, they will desert you. And you that's the last thing any good, you know, any recruitment business wants, you want to retain your talent, especially during a difficult period. Heather? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And Hang on, um, you agree with me? Heather? Sorry, it's, 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 too, it's, too fl- it's too fluffy for HR. Sorry. It's too, well, <laughs> yeah, you asked me something about numbers. So, so yeah, there, it is difficult to get the, the balance right but i've always i always err on the side of transparency is better um and it engenders trust in your teams and it's about the culture that you're creating so but one of the th- i don't know one of the things you're getting at how it is also about how often you remind people about stuff linked to their commission so you know it that's a that's a slightly different question isn't yeah. it and and actually all the time <laughs> so yeah it would be my answer to that you know especially when we're in a tough market because it's very easy for people to get demotivated so you know if you've got a good commission scheme keep telling them about it keep telling them about the opportunity and why they're still hammering away at it so just as a sidetrack on that question Stuart would you rather talk to your staff about the gross profit of the business or would you talk about the net profit or EBIT mm. uh, okay. <laughs> there might there might be two answers to that depending upon the level of staff okay okay so the senior staff um happy to share more information um the, the staff that are um i guess more part of the, the wider business probably don't have an understanding of that as yet or or maybe don't even care as much so i think it's important that that they just get headline um a headline summary which shows how we're doing where we're going what's likely to happen so it's interesting i I had this conversation with a client yesterday about you know do we talk to gp or do we talk about you know net and and it was interesting that you know the, the, the different understandings of the business and when we brought the management in they would rather talk about the net when we've talked to the staff they didn't understand that and you see you see right so they talk about the the gp and obviously you can make correlations with the gp shrinking growing standing still etc you still have the same conversation it's then how you manage the business underneath that but it's what you're talking about is not creating fear by not saying anything or saying too much that, that that becomes that and what you're saying heather is there are lots of good things within those financial reports that you can highlight people back to to motivate them to help them sell and and move from there 
It's interesting that you... Sorry, go on, Chip. I was going to say that some some people can only influence certain parts of the business. Mm. Um, yeah. So they people want to help, generally. Yes. Right? People want to help. They want to be a part of a team. They want to be... Um, you know, able to pull the business through this, but they need to know what they can do and how they can help. And some people can't do anything but help GP. They have absolutely no control over the overheads of the business, for sure. example. Yeah. So, so net profit is irrelevant to them. Yeah. And that's the, the, the comment that we came to, which line can you affect and how do you affect that line? That's what you should be driving on. And then what's the implications around affecting that line in a positive, negative or standstill point of view? It was interesting that we've sort of alluded to, you know, your comment there, people, you know, look after your people. Because two clients, have said, as I said last week on the webinar, said staff are key to getting out of recession. So what would you add to that? Because obviously we know if we look after our staff, it should look after our, our, our clients. You know, what would you add to that comment that would say, what else rather than staff should we be focusing on to help us move away from this, you know, vision that recession is coming? Uh, it's, I would focus on, so the leaders are equally as important as the staff because the staff follow the leaders. Um, they need to give themselves space in order to think about these things. Yeah. We, we know, you know, we're in a, a really busy time, still a really busy time, and it's been manic for, for months and months now. Um, and people are almost making hay by the sun shines. Um, and that comes back to the question earlier about um, hope being a strategy. You need to put the time aside to actually plan for this. So business leaders need to set up a day a week, however long it takes, just where they, they take themselves out of the operations of the business and they focus on strategy, culture, whatever it may be to, to protect their business um, or to enhance their business. Because let's face it, some recessions bring plenty of opportunities to other businesses um, and, and whatever lies ahead. Yeah, I, th I think that's, in, that's absolutely true. You make a great point that, you know, a couple of things here. You know, I, we hark back to the COVID days and Howard's point about the webinars that we were running regularly throughout every week. And the main reason we did that was because we felt people needed to need an outlet. They needed to talk and listen um, about their fears, their concerns. Uh, so if, if you like, we did a huge amount around that time. And I think that it's really important for leaders to be able to uh, as you say, step back, observe, um, do some research. As I said earlier, talk to clients, obviously look at and talk to candidates, but it's important as well to listen to other people around them, experts in the industry, just to try to get some understanding as to what's going on. The thing that we know about business is that business hates uncertainty and there is a really distinct sense of uncertainty at the moment. People really don't know what's likely to be around the corner. We have a sense for it, but you know, as we've talked today, there are good signs and some pretty bad signs. It's a real mixed bag at the moment and people are very uncertain about what may happen during the winter period and beyond. Um, so being in a position, as you say, to talk to others, uh, to listen to people like yourself, Stuart, or people like us, or go and talk to other experts in the industry or outside of our industry, those things are important. Um, to take support, to listen to expert views and advice, all those things I think are important. Um, and it's, as we said, during that COVID uh, period, very important, I think, to talk because it's good for your mental health. Because often leaders find themselves very uh, feeling very isolated, worried about the future, concerned about what's around the corner. And I think there are people uh, at peer group level or, or others around them that they can talk to um, and take advice from. And I think that's a very important thing. Uh, we've learned that from previous the last few years, and I think that's going to be an important feature going forward. Mm, well, I think the... Um... It, that old cliche that we we say all the time about work which is exactly what Stuart's just saying about working on your business not in your business yeah so it's really easy isn't it to panic and to just think that actually I need to just get back on a desk and I need to just stay in my lane and keep on you know focusing on it, impacting billings and actually that taking time out to do the planning is so important and to do that planning with your senior people in your business and you know to spread the load of that and protect your own mental health as a leader i think that's that's so important now it couldn't be more important actually at a time of a yet more change because <laughs> we've had a few years of that haven't we but yet more change 
to mm. actually take okay. the time out to plan and so that you're consciously mm -hmm. doing things in your business, not just reacting to what's going on today. I think it was interesting sort of during lockdown, I had a client who made a statement to his staff at the beginning, I will not lay anybody off during lockdown. And then when you know uh, furlough came along, he didn't put anybody on furlough. And what his comment was, he said, I am going to market myself to my business and then I'm going to make my business market to my competitor to, to, to my clients out there. And I'm going to see what my major competitors do. And the most of his major competitors in his market, in each marketplace, laid people off, put people on furlough, et cetera. And he massively swept up the competition. He massively swept up the client base because he had everybody focused in a really positive manner because he marketed his own mindset to the client, uh, to his candidate, uh, to his uh, consultant base. And they then did the same out to the clients and to the candidates. So I think to me, that big thing, it's about marketing to the business and marketing out to your clients what your prospective view is going to happen and what's going to do. And whatever we say about recession, never stop marketing your business because that's what's going to start to move you away from your competition and drive you into your competition. The old cliche, they say a good count should cost you very little, Stuart. Oi, oi. Oi, oi. Uh, so I, 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 I didn't, I, I heard it from an accountant as he gave me the bill. Um, he said, uh, where would you start looking to reduce your operational costs of a business and why? Good question. Um, recruitment businesses are quite simple entities. Um, there's not a significant operational outlay other once you start looking beyond staff, staff and premises really. Um, I know there's lots of job boards and LinkedIn and all of those kind of things that cost more and more as the days go by. So if, if if the intention here is a batten down the hatches kind of approach, then you've got two areas to focus on probably, which is which is premises and staff. And, and staff is going to be your biggest cost. That sort of runs a bit contrary to what we're talking about today because we're we're saying how um how important the staff are but in in every organization there's there's going to be underperformers um and so it's as we lead into yeah. session or we're looking to cut costs it does give you the opportunity to um you know it's not a nice phrase i suppose but clear out the dead wood um well you've got hr here careful what you're saying Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> um i, I look I, th I think i think the one thing i'd add to your point is that it, you know where you are looking at costs you know don't remove costs that are relative to the experts around you so for example great accountant i'd like to think people like us <laughs> because you need <laughs> expertise you say that i might as well that. say that you know <laughs> But I think, you know, when you're going through a tough time, particularly, you need that support, you need that expertise to help guide you through those periods, particularly. So, uh, but your point about the staffing situation isn't just relative to uh, going through an economic downturn. It's true of any period of time, yeah, yeah. you know, you, yeah. you should always be looking at the performance of your people. I've, I've, the other thing I think you should be looking at, but this is a really small chunk of your costs, I know, Stuart, but, you know, marginal gains and all that. Job boards are increasingly expensive. Yes. So, you know, how often are you looking at the data of whether they're valuable to you or not? Because I know loads of recruitment businesses just throwing money at job boards when actually every single candidate that they're sourcing for those job boards they already had on their own CRM. Correct. So are you using your own candidate data as efficiently as you could? Do you know where your candidates are coming from and are you just chucking money away? And I, that's one that I just think every business should do anyway. It's a small bet noir of mine. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. there's lots of um, systematical things yeah. as well, isn't there? There's lots of inefficiencies, whether you went into a business that was manually processing that needs automating. All yeah. of that helps reduce cost yeah. um yeah i think it, it sort of refers back a little bit to the mindset that howard was just describing and we touched on earlier which is is it one where you're in denial and you believe that actually you're going to just get rid of everybody put everybody on furlough not that anyone's going to get bailed out this time by the way um and and just run as you know the two owners for example running the business where previously that you had 
10 or 15 staff or are you going to get ahead of that curve and be yeah. the business that Howard spoke about so I think what I think what Heather's talking about there, though, is you know a large part of the chunk when you take away staff is that cost of your marketing and cost of advertising your your jobs out there, mm-hmm. and it's understanding your and and this is the bit that I think COVID really highlighted. It's understanding that although clients pay your bills. They only pay it if you have a really good candidate. So the candidate is the catalyst to paying the bills. So how you procure your candidates is really important. And the less it costs you to procure your candidates, the more you'll make out of each placement that you make. Yeah. And then if you look at how you then grow that candidate base and develop that candidate base, how much are you recycling? You know, I, I keep saying that horrible stat that 90% of every permanent placement that is made in the UK by a recruitment agency, the candidate doesn't go back to the agency when they're moving on next. Yeah. And that is just shocking. So we're saying that, you know, how we supply our product to our client base needs to improve and then how we look after that product within that client base needs to improve as well and they're part of the operational cost that i think that we seem to forget because we're not mining the data correctly to understand where we can actually make money when we start to go into sort of hard times where else can we make money out of and it's that question you know for every pound that comes into the business there's two sides there's the operational costs and then there's the human cost of that pound how do you get more out of each side of it and and that's the bit that we need to sort of really think about and i think the question that we sort of everyone's sort of dying to know the answer to and it'd be interesting to understand your view of this you know do you think it's going to be a long or a short sharp shock recession if it actually happens at all Oh, yeah, so you go. I'll put my neck on the block here. <laughs> yeah, we are recording. This we are recording, and, and, really and it will go out. You, Stuart, yeah. Stuart, Stuart from UHY yeah. said, <laughs> "It's my next blog." I, I think, I think it's going to be a little longer. Would be my view on it. Um, I can't. <laughs> with inflation where it's at, with interest rates going up, people are going to stop spending money soon. And when people stop spending money, we know the impact that has on the economy, that everything slows down, budgets are reduced. Um, You've spoken, you've mentioned some numbers before and some facts before about the employment rates and the unemployment rates in this country and how in the last seven recessions they've been, um, there's only one similar scenario. So that's, that's quite unique here. Um, and we're certainly, I'm certainly not seeing any way any of my clients dip. There's still, there's still lots of opportunity out yes. there. It might not be as good as it was, but there's still plenty of opportunity out there to keep people going. And yeah. again, I think Heather mentioned that recruitment is normally the barometer of this. Yeah. Um, I do. So, I th- <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, maybe. I do feel it will be a little bit longer. I do think there'll be a period of downturn, but I'm hoping that the impact will not be as significant as, it won't be as significant as COVID, for example, but even 2008, 2009. Yeah. I would agree with you, Stuart. I think, um, we've se- you know, as we've just said, we've seen worse. I think you make uh, the reference points, the banking crisis in... 2008 and 2009, that was pretty dreadful. I mean, it was literally an overnight shock. Um, and we had COVID, which was equally sudden and dramatic. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, there are reasons to be optimistic, as we said, we, we have got this massive skills gap. We've got lots of jobs available in this country. Um, and there's no easy route out of that. Even if it shrank, even if we saw 1.3 million, <clears throat> excuse me, reduced to seven, 800,000 jobs available, it'd still be plenty of roles available for, for everybody. The, perhaps a bigger issue, and, and just on this point, is just making sure one of the things you didn't say, but I think will be evident, is that candidates sit tight in jobs. We saw that, of course, in COVID. People sat tight. They didn't change jobs during that period because they felt insecure, worried about taking a job and then finding that they didn't like it and then being able to find another one. That's the sort of issue that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, having that sense of security is important. So we may see a shrinkage of available candidates. But, you know, um, you make a great point here. If you have if you've motivate your people and if you have a good vision for the future, and as Howard said, if you're looking at the basics, things like backfilling, for example, 
um, when people leave jobs, if you're looking and training your people correctly uh, for the opportunities, uh, there's still plenty of money to be made. And long or short recession, um, or indeed whether there is a recession or not, I think there's plenty of opportunity for people over the next year or so, uh, even if things get tighter in the economy. Um, I don't see it <clears throat> being that fall off the edge of a cliff scenario that we've experienced in the past. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So we talk about, you know, V-shaped and U-shaped and all this kind of thing. I see this one being a bit of a shallow W. So I think we are going to have a small, small drop off. And then I think it's just going to do this for a while. Mm. Um, and maybe, maybe over the next couple of years, it'll start to do this slightly trending back upwards, um, depending on whether we resolve the situation in Ukraine and what happens with inflation oh. and kind of stuff like that. But it's so it's a kind of long haul challenging market but you know it's been challenging already so i i don't think we need i don't think it's a catastrophic change it's more of the same focus well, on your candidates yeah. focus on your relationship with clients yeah. focus well, on your candidates i've got to go I've, I've heard it all now i've heard of the hockey stick i've heard of the bath <laughs> shape <laughs> i've never heard of the, i've never heard of the wiggly wobbly w recession recovery <laughs> strategy but that but there you go yeah, but Stuart was nodding and he was in the <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he was about to send you the VW, the V. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so to, to, to push on from there. So what we're saying, if we pick the bones out today, what we're saying then, Stuart, is take care of your cash flow. Really be smart about your debt. We need to get the management structure in place and the management talking the right things and where you talk about the right cash in that. We need to master our core competencies and be really good at that core competency. We need to carry on marketing to make sure that we're still out there driving into the competition and taking market share from the competition. And obviously, the, the, the one is, as a manager and an owner of the business, your reflection of what is happening will be cast across everybody in your business so if you're reflecting in a positive way then it will come in a positive way if it's a negative light it will come out in a negative light but look after the figures if you understand your figures and where things come from then the figures will look after you hence look after your people and move forward from there Perfect. brilliant pleasure well let's leave it there Stuart thanks very much for your input it's been always interesting to hear it from a different side and obviously you deal with lots and lots of recruitment agencies so hearing that you're not seeing your clients drop as well will obviously give lots of sort of a, a good good feelings to to the people that are listening today next week if you want to join us next week we are at the expo so join us wednesday at the expo in birmingham so there will be no webinar next week because uh, we're at birmingham but the week after we are going to look at how you should really plan and pulling plans together and as Stuart alluded to our view of a plan it is not here's a budget hit the budget there's lots more sides but the importance of hitting your figures the strategic side of developing the business around that is absolutely critical when we come into harder times from there so Stuart once again thank you very much Heather absolutely pleasure Arkwright thanks for your input there always appreciated <laughs> look forward to seeing you all again in two weeks time if you want to meet us at the webinar uh, sorry at the expo feel free to drop us a line catch you all in two weeks time bye everybody bye. take care bye bye thanks Stuart cheers, cheers.